this got away from us. Yeah, we're going to have to do another take. <laughs> <laughs> who are here to talk to you about one of the most important parts of any Dungeon Master's campaign, the Big Bad. Having an overarching villain as a structure or a framework to a campaign is tried and true DMing. It really helps to have a consistent force for your players to be fighting against and that they can eventually, hopefully, triumph against. However, you have to be on the ball for your villains. No matter how much preparation you put in, your players will improvise and they will surprise you. And all of a sudden you'll be on the back foot. So it can really help to really have your villain's frame of mind, the desires, where they're coming from, ironed out in advance. So that if your players do force you to improvise, you're not going to have a lot of time. When, you know, if your villain is reaching for a goal and the players snatch it out of their hands, you're going to have to decide at the table what the villain's next move is. And this is just a difficult thing to come up with if you don't have a couple of things ironed out about your villain already. Hmm. So we thought what would make this a little bit easier to work through is if we combined this aspect of dungeon uh, mastering with a game we all know and love, Magic the Gathering, a dork's card game that's been going for 30 years now, and bases itself around the color pie. Five colors, white, blue, black, green, red, and we were hoping that we could have a bit of a chat about how to uh, create villains based off these colors so that it's much easier to understand their motivations and how they would act in certain situations. If you're not a Magic the Gathering fan, that's not going to matter a huge amount. Knowledge of the card game isn't important, but uh, one of the reasons that the card game has been so enduringly successful is this underlying philosophy system. There are five different colors that you can play, and each of them has a different way of looking at the world. They don't just differ mechanically. They, they do differ mechanically, but not just. They also differ philosophically, and those philosophical and mechanical correlations and how they interplay with each other are really rich. Um, and it's five interesting frameworks. None of them are necessarily moral. So you know, it's not that white is always good and black is always bad, as uh, sometimes cards might lead you to believe. It's just there are five different ways of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. And so even if you're just thinking when you're creating your villain, if you can pick one of these five colors, you're going to have a good understanding, a good framework for how your villain's going to see the world. It's going to be a good guiding principle so you know how to improvise their reactions when your D&D players smash their plan to smithereens in front of them. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just going to have a quick overview. We will be looking at some cards just to um, showcase what we mean. Um, but this is really, you know, if you're not Magic the Gathering player, you really should be able to get something out of this. Um, the goal is to just have a framework for you to be able to base your villain's actions off of. Um, Alright, so, Jack, do you want to start us off with the first colour in Magic? White. White. So, white has historically been the colour of community and cooperation. Cities, towns, villages are white, governments are white. And their representative um, race is humans, people. Their whole shtick is people coming together and, and, and working together and having a good time because they're together. Um, so I thought an interesting villain, an interesting big bad, um, that could almost be ported one-to-one -one into D&D is the creature Avacyn, the Angel of Hope. So Avacyn was an angel on this nasty plane called Innistrad. Think all the Brothers Grimm fairy tales thrown into one. Uh, werewolves and zombies and demons, oh my. So she was created to protect all the humans. She was, she was there as their bastion against, against the badness in the world. Um, and this was all part of another plot, but you know, that doesn't matter so much right now. So her, her representation mechanically on the cards is she gives things indestructible. But which, which means that anything that is trying to destruct them cannot. <laughs> she is literally sheltering all of the humans from whatever bad things might be happening to them. Mm -hmm. um, but this makes her 
This makes her embody one of the aspects of white that can be taken in negative light, and that is white is a very absolute color. It likes picking lines and putting things on the left or right hand side. So Avison, when she became corrupted, she saw the humans as they couldn't live up to their her high standards for what humanity could be. And what she started off wanting to protect the humans, she ended up being disgusted at them. She spent so much time fighting for these people's lives and they go on and throw it all away. So her big twist is that despite being designed to help humanity, she ended up trying to destroy them and, and purify them in a way. A very classic um, <laughs> robot story. <laughs> what? <laughs> Sorry, it's uh, from... Oh, I'm from lost. the 2004 film Robots. Note: Edit this part. <laughs> I see. Um, yes, uh, so white is the community color, um, and it's also the color of rules and, and order. Um, that's why on cards like Aerial Assault, you'll see when white is in Magic: The Gathering trying to deal with problems, it genuinely, generally can't just point and click and remove something. You know, um, you can see from this card. The creature has to be tapped first, as in it has to have, you know, broken a rule. It has to have swung against you in some way. And um, match the gathering creatures tap when they attack or when they use their abilities sometimes. So um, this card here, it's not able to just, you know, white isn't the color that says you. I'm going to kill you. It says you who have stepped out of line. You must die. Mm. Um, and that's a really interesting aspect for white villains to embody as well. The idea of revenge is actually very wrapped up in white's part of the color pie. White says, here are my rules, and as long as we stick in so you st stay within them, the entire community is going to work really well together. But the flip side of that is that we have to enforce the rules, and anyone who steps outside of them is in for a bad time. So a white villain um, might, you know, they, they could be very community focused, but they could very, very easily try to impose harsh punishments on anyone who steps out of their strict order. Um, and this already is pretty fertile ground for a D&D like, big bad. Oftentimes we have emperors or kings who are evil and are in charge of an evil empire. Um, but you know, evil is, as much as it's baked into the history of Dungeons & Dragons, I think the designers have realized it's a bit of a problematic thing right now. It's not so useful for DMs and players. Mm -hmm. The uh, alignment system does not come up an awful lot in 5e. In fact, I think it has no mechanical bearing whatsoever. It's just this kind of fun guiding principle. So and guiding pr oath of vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> guiding principles are fun, um, but you know, we think that Magic the Gathering's one is a little bit better. Just because an empire is coming in and imposing order doesn't mean that they're evil, right? They might come in thinking that they're doing what's best for you. But they're still colonizers, and that's still very um, fertile ground for d and characters to resist. Um, and we see here, uh, I don't think, uh, white isn't necessarily all that evil, um, or all that good. You know, it's, it's, it's not a moral thing. It's, you know, it's, it's a, white has a particular way of seeing the world. I thought an interesting showcase of this was a very recent card um, from one of the Magic the Gathering's basic sets that like, really helps you get to know what the co colors are at their core, and that's Safari's Skyblade. And Safara um, is a big expensive card, but oh, she's very cheap. If you have a couple of other creatures that look like her, that have flying, you know, if you've got a couple of other flyers, the community lets you take, get her out very, very early. And then she gives those other types of creatures that look like her this wonderful benefit. She shelters them, she protects them, she gives them indestructible. Mm -hmm. But of course, you do have to look exactly like Safara to get Safara's benefit. Mm -hmm. If you don't have wings, Safara doesn't care about you one way or the other. And that's, that's a really interesting space for white to be in. White could really very easily lead into this sort of tribalism. You could have an empire of creatures from the Underdark spilling up, um, you know, like Dorogar or um, <laughs> near Fleabin, <laughs> the Dark Gnomes, um, or anything really. And they don't have to be evil, but they just are saying, well, we're based around community, and what our community re needs right now is more land, more space, more power. Mm. So to do what's best for us, some heads got to roll for people who are outside of us. White is really good at drawing these lines and not caring what happens to people on the other side of them. Um, so, as you said, uh, humans are the what, what magic people call representative race for for white. Um, you know, it, human beings 
pretty, society in general is a pretty wide idea. Everyone gets together and agrees that there's some stuff we're not going to do to keep the whole group going along. Uh, we thought that a interesting villain for popular culture that embodied Fine White was actually Thanos. Regardless of how well thought out Thanos' plan actually is. Or whether or not he did nothing wrong. <laughs> uh, he is definitely a character who tried to impose a particular kind of order on the world mm. to help his particular view of community. Um, and that kind of villain is all the rage, if you're anywhere <laughs> at all in d and uh, Nerds of a feather flock together, Marvel fans and D&D fans. There's a very big correlation and crossover. So you're seeing a lot of Thanos types. Um, but again, if you're a Thanos type, if your players manage to swipe away his fifth Infinity Stone from him, you might not be quite understanding as to what he would do next. And hopefully now you have a bit of understanding of where his white people come from. White, <laughs> where, people, <laughs> where people who have a white framework um, <laughs> come from. Sometimes talking about much of the gathering, you feel quite risque. Um, anyhow, so hopefully that's white wrapped up with a ribbon. Mm. We'll slip over to blue. Jack, what is blue all about? So. Blue in Magic the Gathering is the color that represents seeing forward into the future, it's knowledge, it's understanding, it's study, book learning, nerd stuff. Um, and actually, following on from white, blue and white are where you tend to find the most greater good type of villains. The sort of people who, blue is the kind of person to look forward into the future and understand that humanity is coming for a great collapse and then white is the part of the villain that takes the empire and brings it onto that next stage so that everyone can survive this impending chaos um, but a staple blue character in the Magic the Gathering universe is Urza the Lord High Artificer he's been there since the very start 30 odd years ago and his whole shtick is that he likes artifacts he likes constructing robots and golems and understanding the world and learning things and he's very into the science of magic and the reason I put him on this list as a blue villain is because there was this one time where he wanted to go to war and he thought hmm we're not gonna win this war unless I genetically engineer some super soldiers and there were some morally gray areas there especially when he was faced against his villain um, who also was genetically engineering super soldiers. Sort of made the whole thing a bit grey. Um, I think that's an interesting way to take a blue villain in that you can decide the blue villain knows something that's going to happen. The blue in Magic the Gathering lines up with maybe some divination in Dungeons and Dragons. So you can have some ancient blue wizard who has seen so far into the future that he understands that the oh, some, some great evil is coming and, you know, I'm going to have to trample over anyone in my way if I'm going to stop that. But, you know, great or good, they can end up doing some bad things doing, doing that. Um, one yeah. of the... Uh, so I have a couple of cards here myself that help to get across what Blue's about. One of them is Sleep Paralysis. Um, every color in Magic the Gathering, it's a game about creatures and tossing creatures at your opponent. So they all have to have a way of dealing with creatures, but they all do it in their own unique way. And Blue's one here is uh, about making the creature useless. When, when it's tapped, it's not able to do much. So, you know, he, here you invoke sleep paralysis onto it. And that's quite blue. You know, blue doesn't destroy something in, in anger. It doesn't do a pinpoint assassination. Blue just says, well, you're out of the way now if I take your mind from you. If I, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's where everyone's true power is in their ability to think. And if I, you know, remove your ability to think clearly, you're basically useless. Um, and we have here another character um, who, all of these, uh, this cycle of creatures, a cycle is where you have a, an idea being explored across all five of the colors. So I have a, here a cycle of common removal, um, you know, a common ways that the colors have of dealing with creatures. And there's also from Core Set 2020, uh, one of the more recent Magic the Gathering sets to come out, there is a cycle of legendary creatures that really help you zoom in on what um, mm. the color is doing. And all of them are a bit morally new. Um, neutral or worse um, and we have <laughs> Attempsis here um, he is a sphinx we don't know much about him lore wise um, but he's got this preoccupation as he attacks as he does his thing in the game he acquires you more cards and if you ever have enough of a 
basically you're, you're all of a sudden you're thinking about the cards in your hand in a very different way. And if you can assemble this perfect machine, this perfect poker hand, you can just reveal it and then say that you win the game. Um, and that's quite like Blue. Blue is this tinker, it's this designer, this grand architect. Um, a blue villain could easily be someone, some you know, great wizard or, or great sphinx or great mind who is attempting to create and impose a great order. Maybe he's saying, oh, mag magic um, should be more powerful. I'm going to construct some ley lines. Um, oh, but I have to construct them right through um, that human city. Oh, well, you know, who is to say that matters much at all? Um, another thing about Blue that uh, we didn't pick on, pick on too much uh, that really leans into our pop culture character is that Blue is the color that really idealizes perfection. Mm. Blue wants things to be as good as they can be. Um, when a blue mage wakes up, when a blue person wakes up, when a person whose life is governed by blue principles wakes up, he says, how can I make myself the best thing I can be today? When mm -hmm. um, a queen who is blue wakes up, and you know, she wants to say, how can I make my city stage, my, my kingdom as good as it can be? Um, and that's really typified in another <laughs> Marvel villain, mm -hmm. um, Ultron who decided that humanity was nowhere near perfect and he needed to jumpstart its evolution process. Um, mm -hmm. And he was going to kill a lot of people in the process, but Blue is not particularly fed up with that. Mm -hmm. um, the important thing to keep in mind is these colors don't come with, you know, they don't come with the shackles of morals. All of them can do evil things and all of them can do good things. We're just focusing on the nasty stuff today. Yes, it's, it is about villains. Um, so actually in D&D, &D, uh, there's a couple of player races lean quite heavily into blue. Um, the tinkery gnomes mm -hmm. um, really enjoy creating and inventing. And so that's, that's a very, they're constantly trying to make better and better inventions. Elves have this period of wanderlust where they are they, they leave the society that they don't know, they've known to go on a big exploration um, so that they can become the, you know, the wisest and best elves that they can be. Mm -hmm. They want to go around the place and you know, take in new experiences and practice different crafts and trades and skills and become the best versions of themselves. That's a very blue thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, so, but uh, your, yeah, so your villain, um, your blue villain is going to really lean into the perfection at any cost, the control at any cost. Um, I mean, when Urza was doing his eugenics, he didn't ask any of the people if they wanted eugenics done to them, but that question didn't even occur to him. You know, he was just like, God, I'll make the perfect guy. Um, and that that story uh, does not end super well for Urza. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> anyhow, uh, so th that's the kind of, you know, if you have a villain like um, Ultron, who is, you know, poisoning the city's water supplies that those who survive will be strong and the city can, can you know, lead into a, a more righteous day. Um, if you know what that person's first response will be if the players disrupt that plan, you won't be saying to yourself, oh gosh, where am I going to go from now? You're saying, aha, well this person, you know, idealizes perfection, they want to create a perfect world, they're not all that fettered in how they're going to do it. You, you have a good idea, hopefully now, of the framework that such a character would uh, decide to invoke. So Jack, uh, what about the color black? So, black in Magic the Gathering represents narcissism, selfishness, self-ambition, you know, scrabbling to the top and, you know, screw you, got mine. Black is very much the color of screw you, got mine. Um, black is also the stereotypical bad guy. It's where it's, it's definitive um, creatures are demons, you know, classically evil. It's also where you find some of the more um, gross parts of Magic the Gathering. That's where your horrors exist, a lot of spirits exist in black. Nightmares, mostly black. Mm -hmm. Zombies. Um, Quintessentially. Exactly. So, black is where black is where your classic evil happens, uh, and it's very, so it's very easy to sit a villain in black. The, actually, the villain I've decided to chat about today is Yargle, the glutton of um, Urborg. And I thought he was really cool because it's a little bit of a step outside of Black's... It's, it's, it's not the simplest Black villain you can think of. Yargle's whole thing is he embodies the horror and the spooky and the unknown part of Black. The, you know, terrifying ambition. Um, and reading the little bit of um, flavor text on the card... Yar Cool was turned into a maggot, and then the frog ate the maggot, and now the frog is 
very scary to look at and deal with. Um, I just thought that was an interesting way to take a villain to start off with some sort of, you know, unknowable, ununderstandable evil that just wants to consume things in its path. It just wants to grow its own ambition um, and acquire as much power as possible. And it's interesting that maybe the players don't understand this because it is some, you know, extra planar horror, you know, frog <laughs> in this case. An interesting thing about Black, um, I think a lot of DMs like to lean away from morally simple villains. Um, this is the thing I've noticed a lot on a lot of various online forums. People like the idea of their villains having a level of moral complexity to them. Um, this, you definitely can take this too far. Like you're not trying to write a novel in D&D &D when you're running a, a game, and your players do want to feel good as they engage with your content. They, they want to... It's, it's, it's poor form to have them defeat the villain and then all along reveal that the villain was secretly good and the players you know, never could have known and you're just pulling the wrong rug out from under them like that is, is bad form. Mm. But you don't, just because someone has this quintessential um, black way of looking at the world doesn't mean that they're morally simple. And um, one of the ways that the, the head designer of the game right now, Mark Rosewater, talks about black is that black's point of view is that um, everyone needs an advocate and no one is better suited to be your advocate than you. Why should we have any centralized authority or any framework telling us all um, what's best for us? We know what's best for us individually. And those things might conflict. And when they do, the person who fights the hardest gets the spoils. Um, so one of the cards here that I'd like to, to point out, just for a simple quintessential uh, black philosophy, is the card murder. When you murder someone because you think your life would be better without them, that's you leaning into the black part of yourself. Mm. Um, the black creature from Corsa 2020 is Villas, Broker of Blood. And this really shows um, black is the color in Magic the Gathering who's really willing to pay any price to get ahead. Villas here, whenever you lose life, and life is how you... If you, if you lose too much life in Magic the Gathering, that's how you lose. Your opponents are spending a lot of time trying to get you to lose life. And Villas says, no, no, it's not a bad thing to lose your life. I mean... If you win a game with two life, that's one life more than you need, and I can I can do a lot of good things with that life. You know, I, I can turn it into a, a it's a whole different resource when I'm around. Um, so I, I think this kind of thing is this is is quite interesting. Um, what was our pop culture villain for Black Jack? This was no, that was red. Was crowned. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, yes, yeah, so, so it was a Disney villain. It was a Disney villain. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely, I'm not doing a bit here. <laughs> uh, right, so I guess, uh, I actually, I don't remember exactly the thing you were saying. When I'm when I thinking about uh, Scar from um, mm. The Lion King, Scar is, is a, he's got a lot of black motivations. He just wants to be more powerful. He's willing to kill his own brother to get there. Mm. Most Shakespearean villains are pretty black at heart. Um, you know, that, that guy who, um, his, his name Claudio, I'm not a Shakespeare, I've never read Macbeth or <laughs> Hamlet. Um, but uh, yeah, Ham, Ham, the guy who murders Hamlet's father, um, you know, ju just killing people, getting ahead, that, that's quintessentially black. Um, but, it, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can take black. Um, if your players are ever asking a black villain why he's doing the thing he, he does, you know, doesn't he know that it's wrong? Doesn't he know that he's hurting people? That's just entirely the wrong question for your, for your black villain to, to be hearing. Um, from their point of view, everyone deserves an advocate. They're advocating for themselves. You know, if, if other people are unhappy, they can advocate for themselves and try and stand against him. And if that doesn't work out for them, that doesn't work out for them. Um, morality is, from Black's point of view, something that stops people from getting what they want or being the person they really are. Um, black and white don't, don't hugely get on. Um, hopefully you have a, a, a good understanding. Uh, most villains that you would typically be making, I think, lean pretty heavily into black. Um, but black is only one-fifth of the frameworks that we're going to look at today. Um, so now, now we have a look at uh, one of my personal favorites, red. What's red about Jack? So in Magic Gathering, red is the color of passion and throwing fate to the wind. I'm going to do what I want because I can. And aesthetically, it's the color of fire and rage and 
anger. There was literally a card called anger. <laughs> um, oh yeah, we, we actually could have looked at those because there's a black card called hatred too, and a green card which will come late, later to called rancor. Uh, I, I bet we could have like <laughs> we, maybe some other time. <laughs> but um, yeah, sorry. One thing I I just want to talk about this we haven't really brought up explicitly is the colors can also help you. Um, nail down the aesthetics of your villain. Uh, it becomes very obvious here with the cards we talked about, but the previous cards we've talked about, murder. Black is the color of assassinations and poisons and stabbing people. Blue is the color of sleep paralysis, mind control, making you forget things. White is the color of celestial burning light. And it's simple things like these that can really help you build up a... Um, a, an idea of your villain in your players' heads. If your villain is using, you know, mind control magic, uh, hypnosis, mental manipulation, they're going to have a very different feel for that villain than if that villain's going around with a big knife stabbing people. <laughs> this is actually one of the interesting places where D&D can kind of fall flat a tiny bit because a lot of people really enjoy uh, having wizards be their big bad because wizards have all these powerful tools in their toolkit. But because of how the game is designed, most wizards should be taking fireball. Especially most big bad wizards who are going to be fighting a party full of player characters. <laughs> They'd be fools to let fireball go. But fireball is this big explosion of fiery rage. Whereas you're cool as a cucumber, I have uh, thought everything out 12 steps in advance, blue wizard. Uh, it, it's, it's almost, it feels aesthetically wrong. Mm. They should be summoning a torrent of water or creating like a, a, a period of stasis. You know, or like you know, a blast of necrotic energy, not a gigantic fireball. That seems like something like a half crazy red mage would be doing. It is uh, a little bit sad to see your blue mage, big bad, spend the entire game playing poker with the players, putting out the perfect hands, making the perfect bets, only into the final fight, flip the table over because screw you, I've got fireball. <laughs> But anyway, so we're, we're, we're talking about poor red, we're leaving red. Mm. What is the card you have here for red to try and typify? I think I've never seen this card before. Mm. Actually, yes. So I took this card as it represents, um, a it represents a mechanic that mostly shows up in red cards, but I thought it was interesting to talk about. It's uh, Fumiko the Low Blood, and her whole shtick is she's a samurai from the plain of Kamigawa, which is just a rip off of Japan. Um, and her mechanic is that she gets more powerful in chaos. She makes other people attack every single turn and she can really take advantage of that. So it's very easy in red being the color of passion and fire to fall into too much of just an, an angry character who's just trying to get off on the world because they're annoyed at it. Whereas I really liked Fumiko as she sows the sort of seeds of anger and hatred in other people. She brings people onto her perspective of the world saying, yeah, you should hate people, you should be annoyed, you should be angry, you should fight the whole time. And then she takes advantage of it. And it's just a very classic um, way the big bad can interact with the party is by sowing the seeds of malcontent between the players and taking advantage of the confusion in that matter. And that feels like a very red effect. Um, to me, especially when it manifests itself, in this case, as, you know, fighting potential. Mm, yeah, this is something that, it's a, it's a subtle flavor point that Magic the Gathering players, even entrenched players, often miss, is that people, you know, red is the color, it has these kind of effects, they're usually called threaten effects, I think the first card that they can do is called threaten, where you, know, you, you take one of your opponent's creatures just for a little while, you borrow it and do something with it, and mm. give it back. And some people th people think, oh, shouldn't that be a blue or a black or even a white thing, like gaining control over someone? But that isn't really what red is doing here. Red is just, it's the color of passion, and red is able to induce these passions into other people. Red's probably the best color at evangelizing for its point of view. Because so boxing. <laughs> most people feel, I think, a bit fettered at one point or another. They feel like society or the world around them has put them into a box. And red lets you say, hey, just, just cut loose, you know? Have a little bit too much to drink. Kill your grandmother. Sacrifice her heart to be as well. You know, go nuts! <laughs> Just for today, if only for one turn, go mad. <laughs> uh, 
Um, the cards that I had to look at here, um, <laughs> I think Dracus set them all flame. He's deeply funny. He's a dragon, and when he attacks, he breathes lots of fire. You're not getting a great philosophical look into red there, except for just chaos and excess. Um, you know, you're, I, I'm not sure if your red villain should be a dragon who just enjoys burning things. Uh, but they might be good friends with a dragon who just enjoys burning things. And I really like Reduce to Ash here because Reduce to Ash um, shows off Red's penchant for excess. Uh, and this is something that I think is a really good to add a dramatic flair to your villain. Red doesn't just give the exact amount of fire that is required to solve a situation. Red loves fire. Red is going to introduce the maximum amount of fire. When red it burns something, often it's not just going to set it alight, it's going to reduce it to ash. And I, I think, you know, villains who go that bit extra, you know, villains who don't just say, well, I don't like this village, so I shall remove it, it is inconvenient for my plans. Villains who, who instead think, gosh, they are in my way and I don't want them there anymore, I'm going to set them all on fire, and then I'm going to hire a bunch of demons to ruin the foundations, and after that I'm going to salt the earth so that no village will even consider growing there again, and afterwards I'll, I'll, I'll plant a forest there <laughs> on the, <laughs> the, the, the salted earth so that any remnant of a civilization ever having existed at all will be completely scourged. That kind of excess can really add a lot to um, a, a villain from your player's point of view. Do you remember our red villain from popular culture? Yes, I do remember. This was this was Cruella de Vil. This is yes. Cruella de Vil. <laughs> Cruella de Vil, you know, her empire, she, she wasn't a white aligned character. Mm. She didn't say, I'm going to kill dogs because dogs are against the fabric of the social order, which I must maintain for my community. She wasn't a blue villain. She wasn't saying, my perfect world had no dogs in it. And I removed all, <laughs> all the dogs from them. She wasn't a black aligned villain. She didn't say, I'll kill all the dogs and then once the dogs are dead, I'll have a dead dog empire. Her song, Cruella de Vil, just talks about how much she really, really, really likes fur. And also the thought of dead dogs. So <laughs> she's doing this for her. <laughs> she did it because she could. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's where you're. Uh, you know, oftentimes red villains. Uh, when you think of them first, they might be like evil for evil's sake. But in reality, um, red does have quite a leg to stand on philosophically. Like red isn't just the the, the color of the moron or the ogre or the brute. Mm. I mean, red's the color who says individuality and my own ability to make my own decisions are so, so important. Mm. If you have a, an evil queen um, who is doing things, it might be really, um, if she is red at heart, she could say, well, what right do you have, do you have to, to restrict me and my kingdom's decision making? Mm. If I say that I want to conquer, why should I not be allowed to conquer? Um, I, th I think that's, a, that's an interesting aspect for it to take. There's a lot of different ways you can have red villains. Actually, before we move on to the last color, green, there's an interesting point I wanted to make about demons and devils. Um, so black has, in Magic the Gathering, a lot of demons, and red has a bit more devils. Um, where devils, in Magic the Gathering, they're crazy, they're wacky, they're small, little impish things, and the demons are the big, powerful lords who have a bit more control, and, you know, they're a bit more suave. Uh, in Magic the Gathering, um, that's the case in Dungeons and Dragons, the other way around. Dungeons and Dragons, demons and devils are in the opposite way opposite ends of the lawful chaotic spectrum. You have uh, the chaotic demons um, who are involved in a blood war and they're very red, they just do things because they want to. Mm. And you have the much more lawful um, devils who like to amass power and they have a whole very complicated power hierarchy that they're constantly ascending by All the gathering souls. All levels of hell and where you deserve to be and how long you're going to suffer for in the lava pits mm. before being moved on to the <laughs> spike chamber. Mm. Um, whereas, you know, the, in, in uh, the demons, when they run things, the spike chamber and the lava pits, it's all very efficient. That's one room. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's, uh, this, is, this is like a fun little dichotomy where, like, even though these companies are owned by the same, even though these, like, pro uh, intellectual properties are owned by the same company, and they have a lot of similarities. Um, like, just, you know the five main colors of dragon that there are? They are the five <laughs> colors of magic, and they, they line up quite well. Uh, but in this instance, some wires got completely crossed. Um, mm -hmm. Demons and devils are having opposite philosophies, essentially. Um, and that's just a little bit interesting. Um, then we'll slip from uh, red into the last and kind of the most complicated color we have going. The most easy to misunderstand, anyhow. 
Uh, green. Hmm. So green in Magic the Gathering represents nature, and that's a kind of complicated concept for it. How it represents it mechanically is it likes big burly creatures and creating lots of mana so that you can cast lots of big burly creatures. But this whole idea of nature is difficult to sum up because it's sort of a hierarchy, sort of like white. Green says there's a system to the world and we all have to live in that system. Um, but it's not necessarily as community driven. It's more conservative. It's more world driven. It's, you know, the great goddess Gaia decided what we're going to do with our lives. And, you know, you're an idiot if you're not going to follow through on that. So, again, green can be a little bit of a greater good type villain where they see the world, decide the world is supposed to be a certain way, and they're like, I can't have all this campfire nonsense. People are littering in my woods. That'll, that'll never do. Um, One of the things that's really important about green is that uh, green, like, it doesn't get its authority necessarily or its hierarchies from anywhere. White says, well, here is a religion, or here is a, a, a system. A state, a government. That we should impose, and that's really a good system, and here's why it's a good system. Whereas Green says, what works, works. The natural is the natural. Uh, people are their happiest when they find their own place within the system, not when they change and create a new system. So any villain who's actually looking for a reversion to an old way of thinking is quite Green. And we have two very interesting and kind of strange examples of this in D&D. Uh, we have uh, the Adaleth and we have the Mind Flayer. And both of those are like horror aberrations. They do very spooky things. They're very, both very disgusting. They have a lot of mind control. The green isn't really where you would think um, to look at those. But both of them remember a time where they were in charge, where the world was simpler, when the world was better. And uh, you know, the, the Adaleths, they, they tyrannized all mortal beings they, before the existence of the gods. And then the mortal, the, the, the mortal beings, rather, who they, their prayers brought forth the gods into the world, and the Aboleths were just, you know, set low from their lofty perch. And the mind players had this gigantic um, empire in the space between spaces, you know, this interplanar, intergalactic, monolithic force um, that was then shattered. Um, and they seek to reclaim their former glory. Mm. Both of these, the Aboleth and the mind players, they say, the world was great once when we were on top of it. A topic, and it would be great again if we could get back to that situation. Hmm. They're not just black, they're not just amassing power for the sake of amassing power. They're doing it because their vision of the world as it should be happens to have them in that position of power on top. Hmm. And the morally great part of it comes in, in maybe your villain is right like this. Maybe the world was so much more efficient and so much more useful for its resources maybe the trees grew a hundred feet tall and there was no pollution and no sadness you know back in the time before men um maybe they're not right that's for you to decide but that's where the conflict can arise between the players is green villains can just dictate these are my terms i want the world to look like this and you by existing, defile those terms. So it's very easy to build a green villain that the players can just beat on. They can just hate. <laughs> no, and it's a it's it's a great way to have a little bit of um, ethical ambiguity in your game without making your players feel like they're fighting the good guy. You know, like it's possible for the green villain to have a completely self consistent worldview. You know, from from the evil Abeleth trying to, keep, to take in control of the world, it's a chaotic place now. Everyone's doing whatever they want, and the empires rise and fall on the whims of of like random chance. It's terrible. You know, everyone was much safer and more secure when the Abeleths were in charge, and every day was the same horrible tyrannous drudgery. Oh, um, and it, it's if you want to have moral ambiguity in your games without pulling the rug away from your players without saying, oh, actually, the villain was the good guy all along. Um, interestingly, um, Jack, it was a player in my second or third campaign that I ever ran, where uh, the big overarching plot that the whole thing was aiming at and never quite got to was that the world before had been ruled by horrors, you know, by aberrations, by Sladdy and by Abeleths and such. These were um, by uh, Lunar Devils, which are a wonderful aberrant thing um, from the Tome of Beasts, which I really recommend. 
Um, you know, that the world was this formless chaos where nothing made sense and some powerful uh, humanoids, you know, elves, humans, goblins, that kind of thing, managed to band together and impose some more rules on the world to you know, lock things out um, into the outskirts that didn't make sense. Um, and that this was actually an unnatural state imposed upon the world. And so you had all of these abhorrent aberration villains trying to destroy this impediment to the natural order and bring things back to the formless chaos from which their point of view, everything was better back then. Mm-hmm. Uh, we never quite got to, <laughs> to, to that. Um, you, you guys encountered some aberrations who were trying to, to sow some chaos, anyhow. Mm. Um, but that, that's like, that's, this is a really interesting thing where green is all about the reclamation of the old. We should look at the cards. Um, what is, yeah. is Goreclaw, Terror of Calcisma, doing who, here? Who doesn't love a big fuzzy bear as their big bad? So, Goreclaw, Terror of Calcisma, is, um, I think, a quintessential representation of green's respect for power and natural strength. Gorkla's mechanical shtick is if you have powerful creatures, they're easier to cast. It's like it draws greatness to its side because that's how the world is. It's the powerful versus the weak survival of the fittest. The weak seem pretty disadvantaged in that <laughs> scenario. There are bears and not bears. You'd um, like me some bears. Oh, yeah. But yeah, so Gorkla's whole shtick is. Power begets power, strength begets strength, strength numbers, you know, we're going to build a nice strong community together because that's how it's supposed to be. It's like all the fuzzy bears getting a big bear hug and they tear across the land, destroying these defilements of natural um, society, such as these kingdoms. It's like humans, their lifespans are so short, they have no appreciation for the forest and for nature, only these large, strong creatures um, truly understand, truly ever know. Um, I just really like that. Also, bears and underrepresented as villains. In <laughs> um, and the cards that I have to look at here, we have uh, from the removal of dealing with creatures cycle, we have uh, rabbit bite. And so, um, oh, something I really like about green is that green is often so sure that it's right. Um, green believes that this natural order it should return to is a good one. Um, and it genuinely believes in its own supremacy. So, you know, when white wants to deal with a problem, it'll destroy it once it steps out of it, out of line. If blue wants to deal with a problem, it'll like lock the problem up and prevent the problem from even thinking clearly about its situation. Black will stab the, the problem once. Red will stab the problem many times and really enjoy doing it. But green just fights the problem head on. Green doesn't believe that there are problems that can't be solved with by direct confrontation. Mm-hmm. Green says, you know, I am right, I am proper, I, I should be in charge because I'm awesome. Let me show you my dominance with physical brutality. Um, so that's where Rabbit Bike comes in. And we have Gargo's Vicious Watcher. And I actually love the idea of Gar- like a Hydra that is intelligent enough to be a villain. Gargo's here, um, he's a, you know, he really likes, he's a Hydra. He enjoys having other Hydras. He, he makes them, again, easier to cast. Um, and whenever anyone tries to deal with the Hydras, the, you know, if Gargos is watching them, the Hydras are warned and get to <laughs> snap back first. And this is, this is actually a genuinely interesting idea, because Hydras um, in D&D, they tend to be a big sack of hit points that um, most of the time I, as a player, have encountered Hydras, it's been in arenas. <laughs> you know, um, just like in a coliseum, they, they drag the Hydra from a nearby lake and said, please kill this for us, it's... for our entertainment. But Hydras, Hydras are cool, man. <laughs> It's, um, Hydras are a very exotic beast, so a lot of DMs don't necessarily know where to put them. Um, but a great place to put them is on a plinth in the middle of the campaign and be like, this exotic terror is your villain. Mm. It, and you feel less obliged to... You don't feel weird about throwing them into random situations then if they're the villain, because you can write your little backstory about it. Whereas it does feel a little awkward sometimes to be like, I want my... Vi- I, I want my good guys to fight a Hydra, but I can't just have one show up in the middle of my quiet hamlet in the, you know, Black Forest. <laughs> I know, I, I really enjoy the idea of this intelligent, watchful Hydra um, manning an empire of Hydras. And whenever humans go in and try to deal with a singular Hydra, you know, the Hydra's whole shtick is that when you cut one head off, it's head off to grow back. And it's very fun to have that be an idea that exists in the meta. 
of how the Hydra's operating. If the humans do kill a Hydra, the next day there'll be two clones. <laughs> <laughs> because there's an overall coordinate of force. Um, but, you know, uh, we're not trying to tell you to run Hydras as your main villain here. You know, rules is written. They have an intelligence of what for. Um, we'll put the correct number up in the video <laughs> as we show about this. Yeah. They're not, I mean, you, know, you are the DM. Um, if you want the, your Hydra to be smart, your Hydra can be smart. But really, this is, you know, Gargos, the vicious watcher, he understands, he says, nature is best. Big is best. Hydras are best. And he's very sure about it. And honestly, when, when you're facing him down, it's difficult to convince him or yourself otherwise. Um, there actually aren't... We, 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 this is the, the color where finding villains in pop culture is quite difficult. Hmm. Um, because most villains are uh, the active agent in their stories. That's part of the reason why we love them so much, you know? Um, heroes are usually a reactionary response to what the villains do. Hmm. Like Lord of the Rings, um, Sauron makes the world a bad place. Frodo and co. have to go stop it. Um, like you know all of the Avengers like sort of the Marvel storyline is stuff is good then a villain comes along makes it less good and the hero has to respond to the villain to bring things back to the good status quo hmm. whereas a villain trying to return things to a, a, a different status quo is a little bit more interesting and doesn't happen so often an hmm. example of a green hero that I quite like is actually Robin Hood um, Robin Hood I think that tends to feel, feel quite white to people. This whole like stealing from the rich and giving to the poor, in you know in, introducing a proper order to a world that is has an improper order being put put in there right now. Um, Robin Hood was only against the state because he felt that there was a bad guy who didn't deserve to be there in charge. And um, you know mm -hmm. if Richard was back on the throne, then Robin Hood would not be stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. It was Robin was fighting this new order that he didn't think was right and trying to get back to the old one. Hmm. Um, Classic conservative. <laughs> yes, green is definitely the, the conservative color. Um, but it's difficult to think of any mainstream villains who are quite like that. Usually you have your Voldemort, and Voldemort is, I want to rule things, I want to impose my own new order on it, and Harry's going to fight against that. It's a lot less usual for your villain's impetus they're acting out to be let's return things to an older order but D&D is great for this D&D I'm not sure if you realize it Matt Colville speaks about it in a video that hopefully we'll, we'll link in the description or maybe, there's no annotations so you can't we can't have a button no, you got rid of that tragic um, but Matt, you know, Matt Colville has a video where he, he explains to you that D&D uh, &D is a post-apocalyptic setting there are wondrous magical items that are, exist out in the world that people used to know how to make and they don't anymore. Mm. And so you really easily could, the UNT are perfect for this actually. Um, I have a campaign right now where the main villains of the UNT and they are trying to, you know, at one point they were in charge of everything and then some heroic heroes shattered their empire a while ago and they are trying to get back there. And a lot of the magical items the players are finding are remnants of this UNT civilization. So you know the swords they're swinging, the the capes of protection they're they're wearing, the, the wands of stars that they're wielding, all of them are a reminder that the thing they're fighting against, you know, it, it's in their hands. <laughs> it's 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 built right into the setting. And we've talked for ages about Creed now, um, so let's try and have a, a quick roundup. Mm -hmm. um, in D and D, uh, it's really really important to have a good understanding of where your villain is coming from. A one note villain can really kill a campaign. Um, and make a campaign feel pretty hideously boring. Um, I think you and I have, have been a victim of uh, campaigns with uncompelling villains, and especially villains who did not know how to react when players didn't do exactly what the DM was expecting. Yeah. Um, uh, it doesn't matter. You could read into the future. You could, you could be a literal psychic, and your players would still find ways to surprise you. Yeah. You know, all the best played, le le all the best laid plans of mice and men fall to rubble instantly as soon as you, your players have your hands and stuff. And that's that's part of the fun. That's yeah. good. That's what the Indy is for, um, telling these kind of group collaborative stories. But that means you have to understand where your villain is coming from hmm. and not like a, a binary list of things they're going to do. Not just yeah. like this whole, you know, all this like linear sequence of here is my plan. You need to understand what they're coming from, their ethos. And these are five ethoses that are they're easy to understand. They can all be summed up pretty easily in hmm. a single sentence. But there's a lot to them there. Yeah. They provide a good touchstone for aesthetics, um, like what your villain's going to look like, how they're going to act, how they're going to respond to things. And it means you don't have to fall into the pit trap of what a lot of new uh, DMs fall into where they're like, 
okay, my big bad's gonna show up, I'm gonna freeze time so that my uh, players can't even so much as talk to him. He's gonna spiel his speech and then he's gonna enact it word for word. Whereas this way, you get to have an idea, you get to have a sort of a, a little nugget of a villain and you, you can let him react to other s situations, you can let them survive contact with the players, you can let them have conversations with the players that you wouldn't necessarily be prepared for because you can just think, oh well how would a red mage respond to this, how would the blue mage respond, oh well obviously they'd say something very very witty and then hypnotize them. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think this we're coming to the end. Uh, one thing I thought might be fun, actually, is um, right now we, we, we'll discuss it at all. We'll just say to each other a couple of things that exist in D&D, &D, and the other will try and uh, snap judgment what color they should be in. Jack, the Fae. What color are the Fae? Oh, the five, uh, four, uh, uh, The Fae are definitely green, because they have like this weird idea of how society should no, work. No, no explanations. <laughs> no, it's a, okay. If you're wrong, people will tell you in the comments. Oh, no. What's a D&D element that I should snap judgment on real quick? Um, oh, God. Where do, where do werewolves lie? Werewolves? Uh, werewolves are animalistic. They, they just they live. They, 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 I'm trying to find a way to, to say this without using any of the swear words that we usually come up with. They're animals. They do what animals do. They act out on impulse. They're very they're red to their core. Um, they can't even really think properly. You know, that's a not to say that red is a stupid ideology, but it is an ideology that's very accessible to um, all kinds of people with all sorts of intelligence scores. <laughs> uh, liches, liches. Oh, aesthetically very black, but from a thought process very blue. They have a blue philosophy, I think. Well, actually, no. The ambition to to defy even death is a very black thing. Liches, liches, black color. Yeah, I guess blue means for black ends. But um, anyway, so that's uh, you, you give me one more, and then we'll stop. If you guys disagree, we have not thought about this one at all. So feel free to let us know if we're wrong. Jack was definitely wrong. Faye are not green at all. They're very obviously red, and he's very stupid. I can tell. <laughs> um, sorcerers and wizards. Which color are they? Oh, uh, wizard's definitely blue. Um, you know, the wizard is all about composing the perfect spellbook, and sorcerers are uh, definitely. Hmm. Well, I want to say red because they're so emotional, but I think actually they're green, right? That, that there's a there's every sorcerer is trying to find um, the way to express their truest self. Um, I, guess, I guess that is pretty red. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm flipping around between red and green. Wizards are definitely blue. Wizards want to learn magic hmm. because magic is cool. They have a love for the craft usually. Um, I mean, blade singers not quite that situation. War wizards from Zelda's Guide to Everything hmm. not quite that situation. Uh, actually, here's the fun one to leave it off on, because um, I know you've never even looked into this at all on D&D, &D, so you're just going to be basing it on the word Scions. Psionics. 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 Uh, psionics is... That's definitely 100% confident that's blue. That's blue. It's got to be blue. It means mind melty stuff. <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I think uh, if you look into the etymology of the word Psionics, it'll be something that I'll put up here in the, in the video. Um, and you can all imagine that I said it and knew it off the cuff. Anyhow, uh, I am Connor. This is Jack. And we are Building Better Dungeons.